Welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to make a, uh, as I was telling Naomi, a non-introduction introduction. Essentially, it's all about me. Uh, but but I, I did want to say that, that here we are in the presence of Naomi Shihab Nye. That's why you are here. And I have always felt this long-term connection to Naomi. And, and mostly that's got to do with, of course, her poems. Uh, which are uh, exceptional and beautiful, and it also has to do with her spirit, which is large uh, and kind and gracious. But, there's this. I was born, this is the part that's all about me, I was born February 27, 1951 in East St. Louis, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not from East St. Louis. Uh, Oh, about a year, and I believe 12 days later, Naomi was born across the river, right across the river, probably within six or eight miles yeah. of where I was born in St. Louis. It's very cool. Uh, in, in, I don't know if you remember, I know you remember this event, but this is the first time we met. We met at the Library of Congress in, in D.C. in 1987, I think, uh, for the investiture of Robert Penn Warren as the nation's first poet laureate. Uh, and each of the former consultants in poetry was asked to sponsor a young poet for a very brief reading. I think you could read two poems mm -hmm. if they exactly. were short. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Naomi was sponsored at that event by the great and late William Stafford from a very great Northwestern poet. And I was sponsored by James Dickey. I was going to say more, but I won't editorialize. Uh, uh, and, and that's where we met, and it was, a, it was a strange and sort of wonderful occasion. But even before that, as it turns out, we had this other connection. Uh, Naomi has lived a long time in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I spent some time in San Antonio, Texas when I was in the Army, about eight months at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, I'd been drafted into the Army this was 1971, and I pleaded for discharge on the grounds of conscientious objection. Uh, my application for discharge went fairly well, except at one point I had to retain a lawyer. And I retained the lawyer with the most wonderful Texas, but it also seems sort of New Jersey, <laughs> name, uh, Maury Maverick. <laughs> he was a great, great man. Uh, and uh, an extraordinary presence in my life. And it turns out, I have found out, we have found out, that Maury Maverick was a, the, he died just a few years ago, was a very close friend. And his wife, Julia, is a very close friend of Naomi's. So we've got these connections that go back a long ways. And that just makes being up here, getting to ask her some questions, and I'll leave some time to make sure you can ask questions, uh, it just makes that all the better. So. Thank you. You want to you wanna start by reading us a couple of poems? Well, I would love to, but first of all, I just want to thank you all for coming into this warm, cozy, and dark room <laughs> this afternoon. And I'm very touched to be invited to this community of writers here. Uh, I've been in Idaho a number of wonderful times in the past, but never here. And to visit your community, especially when it's dropping to 12 degrees, has been exotic and um, endearing, <laughs> and I'm really lucky to have met with uh, some amazing writers today and more of you tomorrow. Thank you, Bob, for, for inviting me and Kim and everybody in the department. Um, it's, it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, I, uh, I know that Maury Maverick would be amazingly touched to be remembered by Bob. He loved poetry so much, and the way we became friends is he sent me a poem in the mail it was a J. Frank Dobie poem about wild mustangs uh, that he asked me if I would read it at his funeral. And I had never even met the man. This is like 30 years ago. And I wrote him a letter back saying, well, I would be happy to, but it would make more sense if I knew you. I mean, it's kind of strange to just appear at someone's funeral and read a poem. So he called me up and said, um, OK, let's have lunch. God damn it. And that's how he always talked. And so um, we had lunch. I was scared of him. And uh, he became just an incredible presence in, in our family's lives, as well as uh, he was a big presence in our entire community. He was kind of like the conscience of the community, I think. He became a journalist in his later years once he retired from being an active 
um, lawyer, and, um, and, and he really cared about so many issues and wrote about them, and the last column he ever wrote before he died was about why the United States should not go to war in Iraq. And um, I just really respected the man. So um, it was amazing to meet Bob again last summer and Kim at Fish Trap over in Eastern Oregon and hear about the story about him being connected to you during that time in your life. So, so thank you for remembering him. Um, and all of you today have reminded me, all the people I'm lucky enough to meet with, have reminded me all the reasons why I love poetry, so thank you. Thank you for that. And also, I just have to, as an aside, I'm in a lentil frenzy. <laughs> um, I didn't realize this was a lentil garbanzo cap. This is only one third of the amount of lentils I've bought so far. So I've already been to the post office and gotten some boxes. I'm going to have to be mailing these back. Um, you know, I go many places in my life. I've never been in this kind of frenzy recently <laughs> for, for a food product. But I'll read two, two recent poems that aren't published in any books or anything. So um, this one's before. This one is called Arabs in Finland. Their language rolls out, soft carpet in front of them, strolling slowly beneath trees, men in white shirts, belts, baggy trousers, women in scarves, glinting cigarettes in the dusk. What they left to be here in the cold country where winter lasts forever, haunts them in the dark. Golden hue of souk in sunlight, gentle calling through streets that said, brother, sister, sit with me a minute on the small stool with the steaming glass of tea. Sit with me, we belong together. And the other one is called, Before I Was a Gazan, I was a boy, and my homework was missing, paper with numbers on it, stacked and lined. I was looking for my piece of paper, proud of this plus that, then multiplied, not remembering if I had left it on the table after showing to my uncle or the shelf after combing my hair, but it was still somewhere. And I was going to find it and turn it in, make my teacher happy, make her say my name to the whole class before everything got subtracted in a minute. Even my uncle, even my teacher, even the best math student, and his baby sister who couldn't talk yet. And now I would do anything for a problem I could solve. So. And I wanted to say, too, after Naomi read her poems, that uh, you can hear more tomorrow night just up the road, just up Rayburn Street in the law school courtroom at 7.30. Put it on your devices. And silence your devices, too, I think. I forgot to mention that. Yes. So. I just got a device. <laughs> I, I got my first iPhone last week. It's terrifying when you first get one of those things. You hold it in your hand and you think, this thing is so much smarter than I am and I have no idea what to do with it. <laughs> Carry it around. Yeah, I know, but even how to silence it. Is that you and your father? Yes. This is on the back of the book Transfer, which I think is just a few years old. Right. Is that you? No, that's a, one of my cousin's children. Okay. Yeah. I thought there was a, I thought there yeah. was a resemblance. So oh, can I ask you, uh, that was an easy question, can I ask you a little harder one? Yeah, sure. Okay. This one's going to seem sort of long and involved, but actually I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. But I had a lot of fun writing it, so I'm sort of going to just have to read it. I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's actually a question about tradition and connection and literary conversation. There's an essay in W.H. Auden's great collection, The Dyer's Hand, in which he says, the poet is the father of his or her, you have to work out the genders there, poem. Its mother is the language. One could list poems as racehorses, or listed, out of L by P, or say, out of English by Wrigley, or out of English by <coughs> Naomi Shihab Nye. I think, in fact, there are probably further inquiries, though, that we can make about a poem's lineage and a poet's lineage. For example, I'm thinking about a couple of of our giants, people you know. Uh, if you were to read the early poems of W.S. Merwin, for example, you would see that his, those early poems are enormously influenced by, in fact, W.H. Auden. 
uh, and that in fact he's having a kind of poetic conversation with Auden through the years. That changes, he discovers all sorts of the poem of the Cid, all sorts of figures out of, out of Asia, his, his role as a translator, and the, therefore the conversation changes. Uh, if you think of Galway Cannell, the late Galway Cannell just recently died, uh, his early poems seem like knockoffs of Yeats, mm -hmm. but then he discovered or really came to Whitman and the conversation became with Whitman and he wrote mm -hmm. his first great long masterpiece, The Avenue Bearing the Initial of Christ yeah. into the New World. And then he discovered Rilke, or got into Rilke, and the conversation with Rilke was the Book of Nightmares. What I'm wondering is, who are the poets you could say that you have been in conversation with through the course of your career? Wow, what a great question. It's so beautiful. Uh, and so many of them. And I feel, as a child, I was... Um, in almost a state of delusion because I had a second grade teacher, uh, never had a teacher again who loved poetry in the way this woman did, who really believed that second graders, that's seven, seven and eight uh, age, have a, a, a capacity for being in the presence of Emily Dickinson, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, Walt Whitman, William Blake, and absorbing that language and owning it and being triggered by it. and. Uh, in no way did she ever suggest that those, those voices or other voices she shared with us, whom we all fell in love with, um, were above our heads. So there was that sense of, here's Emily Dickinson and she belongs to me, which I felt early on, and, and then, you know, when I was in college and took like an entire semester's course on Dickinson and thought, God, how could we have felt so confident about our interpretations of those poems. How could we have memorized her poems and walked around spouting them to one another on the playground, which we did, because we had to stand up once a week and recite a poem from memory in her class. Um, how could we have felt that that, that language um, could be carried by people as, as small as we were? How could we do that? And I think it was her sense of love and her sense of necessity, that if we had language like that within us, even if we didn't fully understand it and we couldn't really explain it, um, and imagine these seven-year-olds going home saying Dickinson poems to their parents who were fighting or God knows doing what, um, and them just staring at us sometimes <laughs> like, who is this creature? Um, but we felt confident that they were ours. Those were our poems. They belonged to us, and, and we understood them in our own ways. So I think I started out with this delusion that all those voices belonged to me, and I could, in fact, mimic them or write in a long Whitman-esque line or a long Carl Sandburg kind of line or a short Dickinson compact poem. I could, I could do these things at a very young age, and I could try it out, and, and I'd be infused by it, and something would happen that was bigger than I was. Um, and by the way, I never went to a, I didn't go to a writing program, and that's been something over the years that has caused me to feel a little like an imposter when I visit so many great writing programs. I mean, I have this, this backhanded wistfulness, like, I want to be here. Why, why didn't I get to do this? I want to do this. I want to study with you. I want to stay with everyone. And, um, and I mentioned this once to Philip Lope, the writer who started out as a poet and became more widely known as an essayist. He lives in Brooklyn a really wonderful writer, and he also was known for memoirs he did, like a famous one called Being with Children, about the Poets in the Schools <coughs> project uh, 40 years ago, 35 years ago. Um, Philip Lope, tonight I'm missing him, he's speaking in our town and doing a big benefit there tonight, but I said to him once, you know Philip, he was admitting, I, I got to know him over the years slowly, and he was admitting something he maybe had misgivings about, and I said, well I have misgivings about the fact that I wasn't really trained, you know, so how could I how could I follow a tradition or really discuss anything in intellectual terms because I went straight into working in school, straight out of college. I started publishing poems when I was seven. I started sending poems actively to magazines. You know, when I was 12, I would talk about my rejections. And, um, <laughs> and it was fine. I was very comfortable with all my rejections at the age of 12. And, and always have been. And I've never, you know, worried about them. I didn't have 
the, the sense that some people had, some other writers I knew when we were getting out of like undergrad college, just like regular college, not writing program college. Um, when we were getting out, you know, some of my friends were saying, oh, it's going to be years yet before I send any of my work away. And I thought, my God, I've already been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> or no, no, by then it was like 15 years. So um, that sense of, did I start before I was ready? Did I start as some novice with a delusion? Did I, how did I start doing this? I started as a reader and as a, as a person who loved poetry and found in poetry a kind of language that I, that I needed to be at home in. And Philip consoled me, saying, you know, there are two groups of people. There are people who are trained. There are people who go into various kinds of academy and who study and who have lots of response to their work uh, when they're young. And then there are those who grew up in the streets. <laughs> and we need people who grew up in the streets. And you're still in the streets. And he was saying this in a way to comfort me, but all these years I've kind of weighed that and thought, but maybe it's not good, you know, maybe I don't deserve to be in programs, be visiting programs if I never went to one. So maybe I don't deserve to teach the first year seminar at the Missionary Center for Writers. So that's been something I weighed. But over the years I was, and still weigh, over the years I was infused with um, an enormous affection for people like William Stafford or W.S. Merwin or Lucille Clifton or the people I felt became my mentors through their books. Um, people I could follow, I could learn from, I could occasionally get to hear, uh, read, and ask questions to. And so there was that sense of being, and, and then of course writers from, from overseas, um, being half Palestinian and reading Palestinian writers and Israeli writers and feeling that this was a necessity for my own mental health as well as my own literary um, backdrop. But, um, trying to glean, working in translation projects, uh, but always as a secondary translator. So I feel like I was always out there trying to absorb the voices that had an urgency, had a, had a, came out of a, a spirit of necessity, elemental necessity, whatever they were writing about. Um, and I think I've, I've perhaps, um, <coughs> read enough criticisms of William Stafford at this point that I can feel very comfortable about the fact that I know my own work would probably also be accused of being simple, but, I, but now I'm old enough to be able to say, I want it to be. That's what I wanted. I wanted it to be work that someone who was 12 or 18 or 80 could read and feel comfortable with, that I was using a kind of language um, that's something I was always aspiring to. Maybe a, hopefully a deceptive simplicity, but I know Stafford was often accused of having a simplicity of <coughs> at least vocabulary, which I think is, I, I don't think he's simple at all. I think he's very, no, no. very rich, difficult, mysterious, amazing he's poet you can keep reading over and over again and <coughs> interpreting in different ways. He's simple in the way that Vyshwava Zimborska is it's simple. Exactly. She's the one with the Nobel Prize, and the people who accuse Stafford and Jaborska of being simple. Right. Where their Nobel Prizes. That's, right. That's <laughs> but the simplicity is rich, and I think you know, even in going back to um, going back to people we loved as children, and and then seeing well, this was always so much richer than I realized. I was falling in love with it because I liked the idea of hope and feathers being the same <laughs> sentence, but um, but there was so much more that was just. Fairly the beginning. I love to think of a seven-year-old walking into mom and dad at dinner and saying, because I could not stop for death. I, stop. <laughs> I did that. I did that. Or staring at you know an adult and saying, I'm nobody. Who are you? <laughs> they don't like it. They don't like it a lot. Right. No, but the, one thing I have told before, but I think it's the funniest thing from my entire childhood was, you know, in those days you only could submit work to magazines through the mail. And so self-addressed stamped envelopes, I had to have my school librarian tell me, what is that? What is a self-addressed stamped envelope? And then I, I took all these little jobs, and by the way, my neighborhood in St. Louis was Ferguson, the now infamous Ferguson, um, where my parents moved when I was three, and then I went to all elementary and junior high there. But so doing odd jobs for people in my neighborhood secretly, not telling my parents, Whose cat am I feeding now? 
where am I working now? Because I wanted to be able to buy the stamps on the sly. There was something about, for me, important about if you're sending work to magazines, you don't want people breathing over your shoulder and saying like, well, did they take it? Did they like it? You know, to me, that would have put a pressure on. So. My mother thought I was writing letters to myself in the mail. <laughs> and, and after I'd been receiving self-addressed stamped envelopes for quite a while, she sat me down and said, uh, I, I want to talk to you. And, uh, there was a mailbox right across the street from our house, and she thought I was walking over there and mailing myself a letter that would come back to me. And I said, no, no, these are from magazines. And she said, why are magazines? I, I was even keeping it a little secret when things were being published. Wow. It was strange. I don't know why I was so secretive about that. But I just didn't want anyone breathing down my neck. It's a, it, it's a private thing. It's an yeah. intimate art. It is. Even when you turn into exhibitionists like ourselves. Later. Uh, so uh, our talk is billed or has been billed as a, a conversation about craft. Right. So could you talk a little bit about what you think when you hear the word craft when it's applied to poetry? Right. Well, I think about generating and collecting and shaping and, uh, and, then, and then working on, working on, working on. One thing I admired so much about Galway Cannell was how he continued to revise his poems, as many people know, after they were published. And before he would give a reading, you probably saw him do this too, behind stage he would be sitting with Xerox copies of his own poems, revising them, even poems that people had been loving and memorizing in different versions for years. <coughs> and when people would ask him about that, he would say, well, I don't love it that way tonight. I need to change it. I, I'm, not, I'm, not read, I'm not interested in reading these you know, 12 stanzas of when one has lived a long time alone tonight. I'm interested in condensing it to three. Um, and that fascinated me, that sense of lively relationship with work once it's already appeared in print and being able to keep changing it. Um, I've always been a regular writer, like a daily writer, as Stafford talks about a lot in his own essays in Writing the Australian Crawl, You Can Revise Your Life, Crossing Unmarked Snow, the books of essays that were gathered um, of his commentaries on writing. <coughs> and from early life I felt it was important to keep keep that habit up of daily writing, even if um, you were just, you know, gathering notes and quotes and gibberish and bits and pieces and you had no idea where they were going, but I think it helps you to do that regularly. I always felt suspicious of, um, and I knew many people who did this at the time I was in college, the, the other writers I could find in my school, Trinity University in San Antonio, who said that um, they would be you know, writing next summer when they had time, or you know, when they got to go away to some writing retreat somewhere, then they would be writing, but no, right now they weren't writing because there wasn't enough time. So I always questioned that, and I felt like, well, we have to be doing it regularly, or it's going to abandon us. So I've always written a lot more, and then tried to find poems within that, and that's when the craft kind of starts taking place. When I'm first writing, I don't think of it as craft. I just think of it as gathering and um, addressing and inviting onto the page um, things that you have witnessed or that you have thought. There was a man um, yesterday in the airport in San Antonio. He was wearing a black sweatshirt that had white letters on it. All I care about is hunting and maybe like three people and beer. <laughs> I was kind of wishing he would be my seatmate, but kind of worried if he was. And I felt there was something there, you know, there, there was a character there. I mean, to wear that sweatshirt in a public place was interesting. Part of believe he wasn't the one on the way to Idaho, actually. Yeah, I don't know where he was going. And then the Yesterday, Delta Airlines was giving away Lindor Swiss chocolate balls in honor of Veterans Day. And when they announced this, at the beginning of each flight, I was on two Delta flights yesterday, at first I thought, well, they're only going to give them to the veterans on the plane. They're going to have the veterans raise their hands. But no, they gave them to everyone. And then that was interesting, how, how they were, I don't know, there was just something, something about that. I wanted to write down their language that they used about being a veteran and what that meant. And, and here's a chocolate ball. 
to commemorate your service? I mean, it just seemed a little surreal. And so those are the kinds of things that I often write down, little, little strange details that I would definitely forget, um, or a sign, or a menu item, or something, you know, those things that, that would be quite forgettable. The different kinds of dreams we have in different places. Um, so that would be the daily writing. You're writing down all these little odd bits and pieces of things. And then when the when the threads start coming through and you start feeling there's something in here that's ready to be shaped. I'm going to pull from this and this and this. Um, and this is one of the glories of keeping notebooks because you have things to pull from. I was just looking at notes I had on both of your talks in Fishtrap. Um, before I came up here, and I'm so glad I, that I kept those notes at Fishtrap because we all went to so many events in a row. And if you don't take a lot of notes, um, you don't remember any of it. Yeah, how can you remember? How can you remember someone's phrases? I take a notebook to the to the movies. I mean, it's very important to me to remember what the last line of Boyhood is. You know, when I saw it the second time, then I'm kind of ready for it in a different way. You know, it's very important. It's not just something random. This has been selected, so you need to select it too as a as a rememberer. And then finding, for craft, finding um, the days when you're ready, when you feel that readiness. And I do think it's an intuitive readiness. I'm now working on a poem. I still, by the way, write by hand. So that's part of my craft. I like writing by hand before I ever transfer anything over. And um, I like writing on different sizes of sheets of paper. I like overwriting so you can cut back, so you can cross out. Um, I don't feel really precious about paper. You know, to this day, William Merwin still writes on the, the envelopes of trash mail from his trash. I mean, the junk mail <laughs> envelopes, because he says he's not worried, therefore, about wasting paper, because that paper was already out there in the world being used by someone else. And so if he takes it, he won't, um, he won't have too much anxiety about it has to be really good. So then I start working with a text and then uh, and I start reading it out loud at that point. Um, reading out loud is very important to a sense of revision and then once I get it onto the into a computer draft where I print it up and look at it you know, I'm really reading it out loud and trying to hear it and, and, um, and trying to trim it back. You know, I, I always find myself trimming back rather than building up I, I guess just because Cutting Talk is a virtue. Talk too much, as you can hear. Huh? Cutting is a virtue. Cutting is a virtue, and to find what is essential in in a big bunch of gathered material is extremely satisfying. Yeah. So it keeps it keeps so uh, that's that's the process, and it's always going on, and you're always in different states of um, um, of crafting with with pieces, um, of course, and and sharing them. You know, I think you hear them differently after you read them out loud. Do you ever uh, you ever run into periods when you just can't? I mean, when you when you you have time, you make time. It doesn't sound like you do. You sit down, and you put words on paper, and you collect these yeah. phrases and images and things that the world offers to you. Yeah. Uh, which I do the same. I always carry around my little red, yeah, my little red notebook. I've got many hundreds of them filled. Yeah. But. There are times every now and then, even for me, when I have the same sort of work ethic, the same sort of need to do it as often as possible, yeah. not daily. There are those times when I can't muster something, can't muster the right. energy or the focus or, or whatever it is that's needed. Right. And I guess my question would be, if those things happen uh -huh. to you every now and then, how do you deal with them? How do you get around them? Well, the, certainly they happen in, in, in those times, um, you know, I think, well, reading is always a big part of what you're doing, part of your craft. I mean, I don't know how, when people say they don't read at the same time as they're writing, I'm strongly suspicious of that because hopefully you're writing all the time and hopefully you're reading all the time, so how can you separate these channels of, of activity? I mean, you need to be doing them all, all the time. So just spending a little more time reading or going back into your notebooks and pulling things forward that you haven't used before. Um, you're always surprised when you go back into older notebooks and um, and you're always uh, discovering things that you had no idea were in there, and so maybe just sometimes just recopying something that's in a notebook can become a generative process toward writing again. But also taking little breaks where you're just doing more reading, and um, uh, you know I th I think that feeling of um, being in a process of discovery. 
you know, being in your kind of discovering years, um, always is always with us. Hopefully, if we're lucky. I heard I met Borges once in his life, uh, and he was introduced to a young writer. They said, uh, "This is so and so. He's a young beginning writer." And Borges, who was completely blind at that time, said, "And I too will always be a beginning writer. Um, I've all everything I've ever done made me a beginning writer all over again." And I just and this student looked so touched by that, and it, I, I loved witnessing this conversation between them. And, and of course, then I wrote down the conversation because <laughs> I thought I'm the observer here, and um, this is beautiful, and it's something we we all need to remember. Um, one of my favorite people in Texas is the filmmaker Richard Linklater, and um, I had a, he came to visit a class I teach um, two years ago or three years ago, and he said to the students, you know, I and they were asking him, what do you think of? Do you think of yourself more as a director of this? He said, no, I will always think of myself as a writer first. I am a writer because I have to be a writer, a researcher, before I write a script, a screenplay, before I make a movie, before I direct a movie, and they were just amazed by this. That he and he said this quote. I think it's okay to be in your formative years for a very long time. <laughs> and I thought, that's, that's beautiful. It's like Borges being the beginner, always starting over, and, and not being too hard on yourself you know, during those, those drought times, or those times when you feel like nothing's really coming together right now. Yeah, you don't feel smart in those, in no. those times. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't feel smart, and you feel um, you feel frustrated and you feel doubtful, but but also you recognize that doubt is a really crucial part of being a creating individual, a creative individual. So you just keep keep that keep that circulating.